So now we're in Ray Powell's humble abode, and uh, we were further discussing issues about like market principles and stuff like that. I was talking to him about my conversations with Stefan Molyneux about planned obsolescence and things of that nature, and uh, Ray felt compelled that we should share this conversation. So, hello out there in V-Radio land. <laughs> so, in any case, um, well, continue with what you were saying, Ray. Oh, well, it just, you know, uh, you had mentioned that you had gone on Stefan's show and, and, quote, gotten him to admit that market obso obsolescence was a real thing. Well, he didn't do that on a show. That was on a private Skype conversation. Oh, okay. <laughs> Planned obsolescence, uh, are we just, yeah. We're just, you know, letting out the cat out of the bag here? I don't no, know. No, it's not a big deal. I've talked okay. about it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and I just kind of saw it as one of these silly overly intellectualized, idealistic uh, debates that is, is based on unreal ideology, just like we were talking about in, mm -hmm. the, in the walk that we just had. Uh, the, the idea that, um, that there is or isn't this thing of planned obsolescence, whereby a powerful business entity can force the consumer market into it's clutches through manipulation, right? That's essentially the argument. Or do you want to, do you want to give it? Well, I, yeah, I mean, it's plan obsolescence is essentially um, a, 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 re, a problem for multiple reasons. But one of the main reasons is that uh, when we're discussing whether or not in a resource-based economy we could feasibly provide for everyone, um, people have a tendency to ask, well, could you possibly produce everything that people need? And we tend to point out that we're already overproducing, you know, into the point that we're actually being extremely wasteful because we basically just produce way more than we need. We produce junk, most, most of which ends up in landfills. Right. And so if we were to, if we can already overproduce, you know, for competitive products and market share and all that other garbage, there's really no reason that we could not give people on earth access to the things that they need you know, um, and particularly of the best quality. And that's that's another reason why I would be using far less resources in a resource-based economy. The idea is that for these powerful corporations, they end up with a better profit margin by producing the junk, right? Right, right. Which is ultimately not good for humanity and not good for the earth, on and on. Right, right. I, think that's, I don't think there's much to debate there. The question is, there are people who say that that's not real, that that can't happen? Is that actually the argument that's being made by some? Well, they, they tend to uh, react as if um, the market would not tolerate it. And um, I, I pointed out that because in the, the light bulb conspiracy, which is a documentary made in Sweden, I believe, about uh, the cartel that is the reason why our light bulbs only last as long as they do, because there's right. actually a light bulb right now burning that has been burning for about 110 years. Yeah. Um, made by an older inventor who his light bulb designs were not picked up by the mainstream, and um, that was yeah. that. You know, and well, I even guess, these new ones they're putting out these the, the little circular things are, are amazingly better. And you know, so that mm -hmm. in the batteries, I think are another good example. It seems to me that there's so much better battery technology out there. It's being so, I mean, this clearly exists. Sure. And for somebody to debate that it doesn't exist as a concept, is that actually what's being debated? I think that the, the, the issue is, is that I think he thought that the market would automatically weed things like that out. And right. And, and I don't think that it would. Okay, so he's talking about the theoretical free market, of course. Well, uh, yeah, but I think, you know, he, he tends to think that it, it also applies to today as well, obviously, although he definitely dif differentiates the difference between you know, the, the absolute free market and what we have today. He makes a very, you know, important right. point, point and point about that. But um, I think that when, when I pointed out to him, which is how I kind of won the argument, you know, was um, that the cartel that got together to decide that nobody was going to produce light bulbs that didn't have, I think it was like they just continually shrank the, 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 the lifetime of light bulbs in a gradual, like, frog in the pot of water process until nobody noticed you know, and his answer was, after I finally got him to ad admit that there was such a cartel and that there wasn't any government coercion being used to create that effect, he's like, well, sure, I mean, who makes a light bulb to last 100 years? As if, <laughs> as if it, was it was preferable not to make a light bulb that could last 100 years. 
Um, which doesn't make any sense to me. You know, why would For the sake you? of humanity, it doesn't make any sense. Right? right, absolutely not. For the sake of profit margins of corporate entities or the, the producers of light bulbs, you can see their, their motive might be there. So what you want is in a truly free market. This is a theoretical concept. Mm -hmm. We do not live in one. It would be debatable to say that we've ever really had one or that such a thing can exist among humans. Right. Okay, but in a theoretical free market, you would think... And the idea is that consumers would say, you're a jerk, mm -hmm. you, you light bulb maker. We're not <laughs> buying your stuff. We'll right. do with it. Well, you're so much of a jerk, we'd rather not have light bulbs. And for that period, they go without light bulbs until somebody come, else comes along and says, hey, I'll make light bulbs and I won't be a jerk about it. And everybody says, cool, we'll buy your light bulbs. And now we have, you know, this is what's supposed to happen in a free market. I'd say that we had times in history where that was much more of the reality of it uh, and and the difference between those times and now is clearly the consolidation of power into a very small group of corporate government bureaucrat uh, you know shareholder you know a very small conglomerate the global elite right, right, that right. We like to talk about so this power has been consolidated and at this time, nothing like that free market exists. I mean, we sit here and, and me being a free market idealist guy that believes that we can head towards those ideals fairly, that we ought to try. But clearly I can see that it's, what, what do we do about Walmart? They right. sell us junk. They're everywhere. They destroy communities left and right mm -hmm. um, by putting out local store owners. I mean, this is, this is happening. And the answer is will stop buying from Walmart. The problem is... But is people, people yeah. the consumers don't have that power for one reason or another. Right. They don't have the power to not buy from Walmart. More of us either get, through the tanking of the economy, kind of get forced to choose Walmart as an option, um, or we just, the, the average consumer just doesn't care. I see that's one of the problems I have with like anarcho-capitalist ideologies is that the idea is, is we're going to encourage, or rather um, cultivate the selfishness tendency and in the hopes that that will cause it to feed on itself and then in some way bring us progress. The problem is is that the consumers of course in a situation like that are just as greedy and you know people are aware of the things that Walmart does. They're aware of the the slave labor and all that. They just don't care. So it seems that that for the consumers to be the arbitrator in situations like that you know, you're, you're going to have people who don't have any choice but to buy things at those prices, or you're going to have people who just don't give a shit. And, and more to the point, they, it's, I call it like economic pollution. It's like it's a slow, <laughs> steady problem that you don't realize right yeah, away. Exactly. You know, yeah. and then eventually you don't have a job. And that <laughs> problem to me is the consolidation of power, Neil, I, I have mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. that's, that's ultimately what's going on. The fact that we even have this term consumer. Right. <laughs> And that we're using it right now shows that that consolidation of power is so prevalent that we understand this concept as being something that's true and real, and it is. Mm -hmm. And that we have been, we have become nothing but consumers largely. Needless to explain, probably to this audience, right? By design, you know. Uh, so, in a free market, there is not such a thing as in, in this idealistic free market, which I'm not guaranteeing can exist. Right. But I like the idea of uh, in, the, in that situation, there shouldn't be such a thing as a consumer. This thing, this concept would not exist. There would be those trading amongst each other. And if one person, the idea is that in this free market, that if one person became too rich and powerful, the rest of them would say, hey, it's not cool. You know, give it up, man. Give up, give up some of your wealth and power. Share a little. We're all, we're, I think that people are generally okay with somebody benefiting from from creating new ideas and making life better through their new ideas that create efficiencies in the marketplace. Well, I guess the question is, is when we're discussing this, are we talking about it from a minarchist point of view or an ANCAP point of view? Because oh, here we go. in an ANCAP you know, situation where there's no government, you know, there is no way to say, hey, give up some of that wealth. <clears throat> you know, um, it'd be hard to accomplish even in a minarchist you know, society where the government just has very little power. You know, there's no uh, system in place to say, hey, give that up. You know, so right. well, so where does that come from? Well, I don't, all these definitions are varying levels of consolidation of power, it sounds like to me. Mm -hmm. 
And so essentially the, the big debate here and what I propose is that largely this consolidation of power almost exclusively mm -hmm. is rooted in the money scam is rooted in the ability to create money out of thin air, uh, going back to roughly 1500s ish. If my research, that's when it really kicked into high gear and they started consolidating on massive scales. And that led to ultimately the global consolidation of, of the money system, the money scam. Right. Uh, and through that scam, all huge wealth and power was consolidated. And once that wealth and power was consolidated through that banking scheme, that wealth and power managed to overtake every industry, every business, every, and we see it still weeding its way through as Walmart destroys every small town, mom and pop grocery store. Mike's down the road here, just closed down, can't compete anymore because the fourth largest Walmart opened up 12 minutes from here. Right. <laughs> this is the middle of nowhere. It's, it's, so this is happening and it's still, it's still continuing the final stages are still unfolding, but it is ultimately that I believe that consolidation of power through the money scam that has led us to this situation. And once that imbalance is there, this is ultimately the, re the result is those, those powerful entities having the ability to manipulate the consumers. Well then, uh, well, I don't know though. I mean, just because like, let's say we go to a sound money system and we don't have a fractional reserve lending system anymore. How does that suddenly change everything? Well, that's it. It wouldn't. I mean, it, it wouldn't suddenly change. You're talking about trying to, essentially, you have a thousand years, right? Mm -hmm. of, it might be 500, whatever, 700, whatever that math is. But you don't know however long it's really been going on. But uh, you can't just fix it overnight. Even if you created sound money today, you still have this consult. I mean, they've turned that scam into real assets, right. gold, silver, uh, land, property, buildings, corporate entities they they are legitimately in in most legitimate sense owners of this at this time so what are you going to do reverse that maybe that's what we have to do i don't know the answer but but no simply simply creating a sound money system today would not unconsolidate the power well that's i think that honestly um i mean we had sound money systems before and consolidation of power happened even when that's all we traded was gold you know before the idea of uh, like paper notes or whatever got you know passed around, the Spanish, the English, you know, all the greater greater empires were only trading in gold, and they were still able to consolidate power in the hands of a few. Um, right. Well, even going in ancient Rome, they were using they were using the shekels. Right, and, and so it's not to say you they don't have to pull the same scam. It's just there's varying there's different versions of the scam. It doesn't have to be paper. Well, sure, and that's I mean. I think that it's important to note, though, that, I mean, I obviously don't support, you know, fractional reserve lending. I just don't think that uh, getting rid of that system alone would be enough. I, I, I guess I just tend to believe, especially now that technology is advanced, you know, we're better off just trying to get out of the idea of making it required to trade. You know, don't make it illegal, just make it obsolete. You know, that, that's where, obviously, I mean, we've discussed our you know, differences on those issues before, but, you know, I think that uh, what ends up happening usually when you're discussing this with most free market libertarians is they panic and they think that you're going to try to make trade illegal because I guess that's what certain <laughs> communist fascists did or something like that. But right, you know, and I it's I understand why they're going in that direction, well, but it's not that's not the direction we propose. Right, I don't see. I've never heard anything that that scares me per se about any anything you're proposing mm -hmm. in our discussions. I, I do understand. When you say things like trade isn't necessary, do you say that? Uh, yeah, it wouldn't be necessary. Yeah. Like that, that concept doesn't really make sense to me because because people want to trade. Right. If people want to trade, they ought to be allowed to trade, right? Well, and they can. I think it's more about Puppy. creating a system where it isn't necessary anymore, so that you're not dependent on it. Because it, the once a commodity is in the hands of one person. Um, or a few people or you know or whatever then those people therefore gain power over others through having you know the the better access to that commodity okay yeah see that's where it gets a little see you're assuming that there's something inherently bad and that there always be consolidation of power just based on trade and so that i guess that's ultimately the source of the debate 
I don't think, well, I mean, I don't want to say that I would assume. I just, I guess to me, it's, it's, it's just, it's a source of power that I would just rather didn't exist in the first place. A source know? of just the mere fact that there's trade? Is no, 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 no. The fact that somebody could eventually through, you know, uh, trade practices, be able to consolidate power over things that we need to survive. Right. Well, the, that, and that's where the theory that, that Stefan Molyneux is proposing ought to, the free market ought to be protected there. Right. In that the 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 proletarian, shall we say, the proletariat, yeah, yeah, the, pro, the uh, common people ought, ought to be uh, powerful enough to prevent the consolidation when they see it beginning to happen. There there will be an instinctual and necessary karmic reaction to it. Mm -hmm. This this person is is being a jerk in our community, trying to be greedy amongst us, and we're not going to tolerate that. There's definitely there's definitely some real level of that that happens. Is it enough to, to stop them is, I guess, the ultimate debate. I'd love to just have a basis of a free market so we can find out the answer. That's, that'd be a great step to me. Can we just get there? Can we, can we deconsolidate the power somehow so we can see how things unfold? Well, I think the best uh, solution to that is uh, not to try to, I mean, I mean, for me, I don't, I, mean, I don't know. When I see the concept of let's free up the market, I look at that as an opportunity for the elite to just become even more powerful, just to outright rule us rather than pretending that they're not like they, they seem to now. You know, um, I, I right. just assume get off the grid and just make the market irrelevant. Yeah, absolutely. And that's <laughs> I'm living it, man. Right. I mean, <laughs> that's where we're, that's where I'm headed for sure. Until until there's some kind of political power mm -hmm. amongst the masses or whatever it takes. One of the new ideas I'm hearing lately is that maybe a couple, a group of powerful people can screw everything up. Maybe a group of powerful people can fix it too. I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting idea though. So anyway, until something like that happens, either the masses kind of get sick of it or there's some middle range of people that are really want to fix some things. Yeah, I think the ultimate solution for people is don't spend so much time sitting around debating politics <laughs> and, and go plant yourself a garden because you know you get that food growing and you do not need to go to the grocery store anymore, guess what? You just did a whole heck of a lot to empower yourself and to empower the people again. Absolutely. I mean, that reminds me of the conversations we were having earlier about our background with the, the whole Ron Paul thing and all the money that we raised and, you know, that we basically just kind of threw away on commercials and stuff. I mean, don't yeah, get me wrong. I blimps mean, and... Blimps, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we did a lot of good with the Ron Paul thing, too. I mean, we, yeah. we did expose the Federal Reserve. I, I sincerely, honestly feel that if it were not for the Ron Paul campaign, nobody would be talking about the Fed. Yeah. But um, on the same token, you know, there are so many other things that we could, we could, as a people, empower ourselves to do. You know, you put together the... The average money from a Ron Paul money bomb, we could, you know, we could easily build a sustainable community. Yeah, yeah, no question. And so, um, you know, it's that's what that's what I'm trying to do. You know, that's really where I'm at with this project. I'm going back into my capitalist days, I guess, to see if I can acquire some of these stupid Federal Reserve note things again, uh, <laughs> so that we can um, take that as seed and, and create something sustainable for a lot of people ultimately. And I think that's very doable uh I, and i hope other people are along those lines don't wait mm -hmm. don't wait for somebody else uh we talked about the habitat for humanity business model right this is a charity why does that have to be why should that be a charity why shouldn't that be the way it's done essentially what they do is they take seed money one time they buy land they buy building materials the people who are going to live in that home and the community come together and build the thing by hand the home, the people living in the home, then pay it off, no interest, and that same money is used as a seed for the next project. So it's a self-sustaining model. If we can create money out of thin air, anyway, I mean, if the government can create, there's legitimate ways to create money, I think. Sure. And so, so why, why shouldn't that be the paradigm? Why shouldn't that be the way we create money? For the purpose of getting people out of their need for money, I mean. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's something legitimate. That would be a legitimate purpose, and and uh, you know, not that I'm necessarily for that as an ideal, you know, creating money out there ever, but uh, and we don't need to probably. But hey, it's worth thinking about. It's worth discussing. Well, it definitely Very seems like a more sustainable solution than spending so much money and educating and re-educating ourselves to, you know, into jobs that are just going to get outsourced again and again and again and again and. 
you know, it would, you know, the amount of money that people spend on their educations or their political campaigns could easily be put towards just trying yeah. to get off the grid and, you know, and yeah. to be really be free. Right. And that's, that's, that's where I'm at. You know, as far as all these people still trying to do the political stuff, mm -hmm. I have to say that, uh, 